best stories in sports. This is an E60 feature presentation. It's late April in New York City, and Ray Lewis is in Harlem, mentoring kids from the neighborhood. Every man you ever meet in life, you give him a firm handshake like that, and you look him right in the eye. Lewis is here with his charity, the United Athletes Foundation, to help kids who are very much like he was at their age. Hi, Ray Lewis, nice to meet you. As the event winds down, he stops to make a phone call. Give me a song, though. I got to go. I got to go. But give me a song. I need me a good one. The voice on the other end of the phone belongs to the man who has influenced Ray's life more than any other, the man who knows Ray's deepest pain, who met Ray long before his football success. At 37 years old, Lewis is one of the greatest linebackers in the history of the NFL. In 17 seasons, he's been a Super Bowl MVP, was twice named Defensive Player of the Year, made 13 Pro Bowls. Yet for most of his life, he was scarred by what he didn't have. What I went through as a child, a child shouldn't go through. I became bitter. I became very bitter, and I became pissed off. Young, young. Ray Lewis was born in Bartow, a small city in central Florida. His mother, 16 years old and single, got the name Lewis from a family friend. Ray's father, 19-year-old Albert Ray Whitehead, was in prison at the time. The first time he saw Ray, his son was already nine months old. I didn't find out that she was pregnant until my incarceration, after I had gotten out. They said, go in there and get that little ugly thing. And they brought Ray out. And when Ray looked around the door, he looked right in my eyes. And uh, that was the first time I seen him. How come after you met him as a baby, you didn't decide, OK, I'm going to be this kid's father and I'm just going to be with him? I had two other girls pregnant. So it was a mess. I was running with some cats at the horse stables. They had found a big jar of the uh, encyclidine. It was a horse tranquilizer. If you sprinkle it on marijuana. And it sent me in another world. That other world did not include Ray, who was living 20 miles from his father in Lakeland. Ray's father worked at a meat storage company, but he didn't pay child support. Instead, Ray got broken promises. I would always get those phone calls. You know, your dad is coming in town. Your dad is coming in town. I didn't have much to pack. But I would grab my stuff and sit by the front door, sit on the couch, or sit on the curb, and wait for a man that never showed up. It's the loneliest time ever. It's the loneliest and most quietest time you'll ever find in your life. When Ray was six, he found football. And I was coming in from football games, and I would come in, and mom was working three jobs. I didn't have nobody to tell who, how good I was doing. You know, like, I'm, I'm like, I'm good. You know, coaches would tell me, but... You had no dad to brag to. Come on. No dad, to tell, no dad to slap you on the back. That's the ultimate. The ultimate is daddy. How do I live life with no confirmation of a father? How do I go out and compete in sports and never hear my father's voice? I started training because my father left me. The only way I can get through the pain sometimes was just do push-ups and sit-ups until I passed out. For the next decade, Ray's father was rarely a part of his life. Then in 1990, his sophomore year in high school, a coach looking to motivate Ray handed him a yearbook from 1975 that listed the school's athletic records. 
And when he handed me the book, he said, you'll know what to do with this. I looked at the first picture, I said, that's my father, that's my daddy. And I flipped the next page and saw that his name was number one in every record. I was so pissed off, I said, I got it. I said, I got it. I'm finna go through these books and I will train so hard that I will never stop until his name is erased, ever. Day after day after day after day, I mastered it. And every time his record would fall, I would go in my garage and I would scratch it. Scratch it and throw it away. I said, that's one down. That's one down. Ray became an All-State linebacker, and in his senior year, his high school's first All-State wrestler. Then in 1993, he accepted a scholarship to play football at the University of Miami. Reed Lewis ripping through the offensive line. At the time, Ray's father was living in Delaware. The father and son still rarely saw each other, and when they did, it often didn't go well. All the times Ray went back and forth, even through college, even through high school, he still hurt them. So the hurt kept occurring, it didn't stop there. Yet even after the Ravens drafted Ray in 1996, after he reached the Pro Bowl in his second season, Ray was unable to fully let go of his father. It's nothing like your real biological father, and that's what he was missing. I do crave a relationship with my father. I do crave a conversation with my father. Let's just talk. Let's just, let's hang out. Come see me sometime. A pattern developed. Ray's father would come see him briefly, often ask for money, then disappear. In my frustrations, I was bitter. I was bitter because I was like, listen, Pops, I love you, man, but don't ask me for nothing. All I wanted was a conversation. All I wanted was you to come say, good job, son. In June of 2000, when Ray pled guilty to an obstruction of justice misdemeanor in connection with a double homicide, his father wasn't there. Seven months later, when Ray led the Ravens to a Super Bowl title, his father wasn't there. Over the next few seasons, Ray tried to stay in touch, at times inviting his father to games. I seen him before the game. Yeah, I seen him. He would tell me he's going to be, uh, he'll meet me in the lobby. So he'd come down to the lobby and see me. And I, I felt out of place. When I get in the car, I always break down. Start crying? Yeah. What drugs were in your life at that point? Cocaine then. And harder drugs. I used to snort heroin at one point. And then uh, crack cocaine came around. And I got a taste of that, and I was uh, called it covering up my pain. Then, in late December of 2005, a phone call. But one day, the girl I was living with called Ray Lewis on the phone. I was listening to her, and she said, Ray, it's gotten bad. So he told her to tell me that if I were going to rehab, he would pay for it. I said, you don't need to call my children for me. I can handle me. I said, I don't want my son to help me in this situation. I need to help myself. Within days, Ray's father entered rehab. And I stayed there four and a half months. And January the 6th, 2006 is my sobriety day. That's the day I gave it all up, everything. And I sought out for my children. And I wanted them to love me. But Ray remained skeptical, and for more than two years, he kept his distance, seeing his father only sparingly. Then, in the spring of 2008, Ray took a business trip to Charlotte. Ray came to where I was living at here. He knocked on the door, and I opened the door, and it was Ray Lewis. He was like, you want to take a ride with me? I was like, where you want to go? He was like, just take a ride with me. I said, okay. So I got in the car with him. I talked six hours to that boy. I'm, I'm serious, I talked to him for six hours. He was sitting over there, he wouldn't say nothing. I sat on the passenger side, and my mom, I prompted this the first time in my life, I didn't say a word. Tell him everything that I felt, everything that I've been through. And I let him say whatever he wanted to say. 
get this whole story out. Say it from the time I was born to right now, present, why you want to know. What I can do is tell you from my point of view and all the time that I was away from you, it's not a day that passed by that you wasn't on my mind. So it's important to me to, for you to understand how bad I feel and felt about that whole situation. And I sat there and I was numb because I was just listening to the times and the reasons why you said you couldn't be there. And I'm looking at you saying, wow, I'm the polar opposite. I'm night and day from you. They drove nearly 300 miles. Ray's father then stopped the truck in front of a house in New Bern, North Carolina. And I walked into a home to where I met my grandfather for the first time. Shady Ray Whitehead. We spent the night, we was up all night. We were just talking. That night, Ray learned his father had also grown up without a dad and that his grandfather's father had abandoned him too. And his father had done the same before that. Who knew that the cycle was so vicious that him and my father went through the same thing? Yeah. Five generations of men. And I just sit back and I looked at both of them. I said, that's my son and that's my father. So then I asked God, I say, if there's going to be a time for this generation curse to break, then God let it happen now. That everything that you told me, all the pain that I, I once felt is gone. I'm done, man. Since that drive, Ray has set out on a mission that no child should feel as abandoned as he once did. Whether it's one of his own six kids or the children he mentors through the United Athletes Foundation in places like New York, or those living in the part of Baltimore, where he and UAF are working with builders of hope to restore blighted houses. Houses like the one he grew up in all those years ago when his father wasn't around. Whatever knowledge you have and you gain is to share it with somebody else. Whatever pain you've been through, share it with somebody else so they don't have to go through that pain. Which brings us back to that call on that afternoon in April. The song, a gospel tune called I Feel Like Going On. And the man at the other end of the phone? I feel like going on. All right, all right I got to go. I ain't messing with you no more. Leave me alone. <laughs> what does it mean to you when you and your son sing that song together? We feel like we're going on. We don't have to go back no more. We don't have to turn around. We are moving forward, you know, because life is moving forward. I call him all the time. I'm like, man, come see me. Like, I need to see you. Now, like, man, me and him will sit in the house. We'll watch our sporting events. We'll watch our movies. We'll do everything together. I finally have an opportunity to say I'm his father. And, uh, I'm happy now. I am happy now. Ooh. The game of fade. The game of doubt. I feel like going. Fathers never die. Going on. I feel <laughs> like. I'll call you later. I'll I call you later, man. I love you, man. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For more sports highlights and analysis, be sure to download the ESPN app. And for live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+.